2.15 a.m. The water had crept up almost to the captain's bridge, and it seemed a question only of minutes before she sank. The Titanic's light still shone brightly, and I found myself wondering if, if those in cabins now below the surface were also ablaze. As we sat gazing at the Titanic, she tilted slowly up, revolving apparently about a centre of gravity just astern of midships, until she attained a vertically upright position, and there she remained motionless. As she swung up, her lights went out suddenly, came on again for a single flash, and then went out altogether. And as they did so, there came a noise, partly a, a groan, partly a rattle, partly a roar for, for some 15 to 20 seconds. I imagined it must have been the sound of, of heavy machinery breaking from fastenings and plunging down towards the sunken bows, smashing everything in its path. It was a noise I would never wish to hear again. It, it, it seemed to, to signify the end of everything. When the noise was over, the Titanic was still upright, and she remained so for perhaps five minutes. And then, first sinking back a little at the stern, I thought, she slid, slid slowly forward through the water and dived slantingly down. The sea closed over her, and we'd seen the last of the, the beautiful ship we had boarded four days before at Southampton. And in place of the Titanic, we had the level sea stretching in an unbroken expanse to the horizon, with no indication on the surface that the waves had just closed over the most wonderful vessel ever built by man's hand. The stars looked down just the same, and the air was just as bitterly cold. A great sense of loneliness descended on me, with the realisation that the Titanic was no longer there. We waited head on for the wave we'd heard so much of from the crew, and which they said had been known to travel for miles, but it never came. But although the Titanic left us no such legacy of a wave as she went to the bottom, she left us something we would willingly forget forever, something which it, it, it's, it's as well not to let the imagination dwell on. The cry of many hundreds of our fellow passengers struggling in the icy water, a cry that, that called to the heavens for the very injustice of its own existence. We, we, we were utterly surprised to hear this cry go up. We had heard no sound of, of any kind and, and did not know then that the... That the the whole ship's company had not been accommodated in lifeboats. So the cries of the drowning filled us with, with horror and stupefaction. We longed to return and, and rescue at least some of them, but we knew it was impossible. Our boat was filled to standing room, and to return would have meant the swamping of us all. And so the, the captain Stoker told his crew to row away from the cries. We tried to sing, to keep all from thinking of them, but there was no heart for it. And the cries, which were, were loud and numerous at first, died away gradually, and I think the last of them must have been heard some 40 minutes after the Titanic went down. In the absence of any plan of action, we rowed slowly forward, or, or at least in the general direction that the Titanic's bow had pointed. We felt in the darkness for a light to signal with, also for food and water. We found nothing. About 3.30am, someone in the bow called our attention to a faint, faraway gleam in the southeast, and then a distant boom sounded across the water. The stoker, who had lain all night under the tiller, sat up suddenly, as if from a dream. That was a cannon! With every sense alert, we, we waited in absolute silence until, creeping over the edge of the sea, we saw a single light and presently a second one below, and in a few moments they were well above the horizon 
and they remained in line. We didn't know what sort of vessel was coming, but we knew she was coming quickly, and we searched for paper, rags, anything that would burn, our coats if necessary. A hasty paper torch was, was twisted out of a bundle of letters, lighted and held aloft by our captain. Our faces were dimly illuminated, as was the water surrounding our boat, and I saw for the first time the cause of our present circumstances, ice. The ship stopped some distance away and slowly swung round to reveal herself as a large steamer with all her portholes alight. I think the way those lights came into view was one of the most wonderful sights I shall ever see. And then came the dawn. We drew near to the ship and could make out the bands on her funnel which told she was a cunarder. Some boats were already at her side by the time we were close enough to read her name. Carpathia. We were offered the opportunity of sending marconigrams to our families, free of charge. I sent one to friends in England. During the day, the bodies of eight of the crew were committed to the deep. The Carpathia had been bound for Gibraltar, but it was decided that she should set course back to New York. A great sigh of relief went round when we were told that the Nantucket lightship had been sighted and we would land in New York the following morning, four days after being picked up. Our docking at the Cunard Pier in New York was met by a tumultuous throng of friends, relatives and, by no means least, reporters and photographers. These newspaper men must have been disappointed in the general air of calm and dignity as we disembarked. Questions were fired from all directions, and quite extraordinary some of them were. It seems there had been reports of officers on the Titanic shooting passengers, and of passengers shooting each other in the scramble for the lifeboats. They were desperately seeking out extremes of emotion in the drama, when surely the drama itself was extreme enough. The principal fact that stood out for me was the almost entire absence of any expressions of fear or alarm on the part of the passengers. I think it's no exaggeration to say that those who had been reading of the, of, of the disaster at home had more of a sense of horror than those who stood on the Titanic's deck watching her go down, inch by inch. One of the most pitiful things in the relations of human beings to each other is that every now and then some of them should be called upon to lay down their lives from no sense of imperative, calculated duty such as, as inspires the soldier or sailor, but suddenly, without any previous knowledge or warning of danger, without any opportunity of escape, and without any desire to risk such conditions of danger of their own free will. It's a blot on our civilization that these things are necessary from time to time to arouse those responsible for the safety of human life from the lethargic selfishness which has governed them. The Titanic's 2,000 odd passengers went aboard thinking they were on an absolutely safe ship and all the time there were many people, designers, builders, experts, government officials who knew there were not sufficient boats on board, that the Titanic had no right to go fast in, uh, in iceberg regions, who knew these things and took no steps and enacted no laws to prevent their happening, but were lulled into a state of selfish inaction from which it needed such a tragedy as this to arouse them.